Last week we need we talked about how we need to be offended by God's word at times because it will say things that will challenge us and rub us the wrong way and we need to instead of skipping over it or ignoring it we need to pay attention to it. And today we're going to learn that God's word is not for us to do as we please. It's there for us to listen to and adhere to. Let's turn to Second Peter chapter 2. It's one of the last books of the Bible. Second Peter chapter 2. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who is distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, these men are not afraid to slander celestial beings. Yet even angels, though they are stronger and more powerful, do not bring slanderous accusations against such beings in the presence of the Lord. But these men blaspheme in matters they do not understand. They are like brute beasts, creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed, and like beasts, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the wages of wickedness. But he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, a beast without speech, who spoke with a man's voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These men are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity, for a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. If they escape the corruption of the world, By knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and have turned their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed goes back to her wallowing in the mud. First or Second Peter 2 is all about religious leaders who preach sin. It's about people who stand at pulpits like this and they say, you know what, sin's okay. Yeah, the Bible says this, but it doesn't, it's not what it's really talking about. So, so go ahead, it doesn't matter. Do whatever you want. If you have your Bibles open, in verse 2, it talks about shameful ways. In verse 3 and in 14, it talks about how they are full of greed. In verse 10, it talks about how they follow their corrupt desire and despise authority. Verse 13, 
they talks about there's shameless gluttony and indulgence. And 14, eyes full of adultery. So these people are teachers of God's word, and yet they live in sin. And they say, there's nothing wrong with it. Now, at verse 1, it says, There were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. There will always be false teachers of the Bible because we always have our own agendas. In, inside, we have our ideas about what we think God should be, what we want Him to be. And there's all kinds of psychological experiments done to show that we tend to make God in our own image. And we can easily just say, well, this is the way God is. I like this, so therefore God must like this. And I don't like that, so God must not like that. And we make God into our own image instead of saying, okay, who is God? And so that's why... um, I, I mistitled this message. Instead of saying not for us, cross out for and write in about. It's not about us. Because the Bible is for us. I mean, we just sang this song how it's, it's mine, mine to cherish and mine to hear. So in a lot of ways, it is, it is for us. I mean, God didn't write this for himself. I mean, he wrote it. For us. But it's not about us. It's not about what we want. It's not about what we can get. It's about God and what He wants. The Bible is not about us having a nice, comfy life with a nice, comfy God. That would be our inclination. And just, and I'm just noticing on Facebook, especially certain certain people, not uh, present company excluded. There are certain people who just will say things, even even other pastors sometimes, where it's like, do you think that Jesus came so that we would have this nice, comfy life with a nice, comfy God? I mean, is that what he came for? so that we can all just smile all the time and and just be comfy and cozy and not have to change anything? Like, sin is no big deal? When, When you follow Jesus Christ, this is a big deal. This is almost... Picture moving to a completely foreign country. Let's say you're moving to China. Okay? You have to pick up all of your roots and leave all kinds of stuff behind. You have to move everything to not only a new place, but a place where they dress differently, where they talk differently, where they live differently, where different things are important. And you have a whole new set of rules that you got to follow. It's just a whole different scheme. The Bible talks about God's kingdom a lot. And if you follow him, it's like you're joining a whole new kingdom. There's a lot that goes into following Jesus. The gospel is not get along and have fun. It's Jesus Christ is Lord and King. Repent is one of the mega themes throughout the Bible. That's one of the things that you'll find out almost no matter where you open the Bible, that, hey, we need to change. We're, we're on the wrong road, and we need to turn around. We need to follow somebody else besides ourselves or the things of this world. Repent. It was one of the things that Jesus said many times. And the reason is, is because how we live and how we act, that's a really big deal to God. Our lives, that's, that's really important. Because what we do, what we say, or what we don't do, all of that says something about who our Savior is, where our trust is, 
and who our God really is. If we follow the real God, we will reflect him in our lives. If we follow another God or some version of our God, then we're not going to be reflecting God. And in our reading that we just had, verses 4 through 9, there's kind of, there, verses 4 through 9 are kind of this big parentheses of examples. It talks about how God didn't spare angels, how he didn't spare the ancient world, he just saved Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah, and he rescued Lot, and so forth. It's like all of these examples about how God doesn't take sin lying down. He doesn't look the other way with it. It's a big deal. And we, we can't just say, well, I'm, I'm saved by grace, and so I don't have to, I can, I can sin all I want because I'm saved by grace. No, that's not how it works. If you've been saved by grace, then you know how terrible, awful sin is. And you'll want nothing to do with it. There's no way around it. Sin will be punished. Now, as to, have to, got to, we have to have balance here. God, God really hates sin, but there's grace too, and we have to have some balance here. God gives lots of freedom in how we serve Him. There's not only one way to serve God. In fact, you could think of it this way. There's, there's as many ways to serve God as there are people serving God. There's universal truths, and there's one God, and there's only one truth about Him. But in how you serve Him, we got all kinds of people here. And we all have different opportunities, we all have different gifts, and we all can serve Him in all different kinds of ways. So you don't have to be a minister or a missionary to serve God. You can be a farmer, a teacher, a receptionist, a janitor, a bus driver, a student, insert what you do every day, you can do that and serve God. And you can serve God whether you are married or single, whether you're talkative and outgoing or, or shy and introverted. It doesn't matter. You can be a really serious person or you can be happy-go-lucky. You can be a bookworm or you can be a builder, whatever. There's all kinds of ways to serve God. But like any person, God is a person, three persons, one God, God can be hurt and angered by our actions. If somebody says something to us, we can be hurt by that. Or if somebody injures us, we can be angered by that. And that's understandable. And unlike, unlike us, God is invincible, but he chose to love us enough to become one of us through his son. And so therefore, he can get hurt by us. So when Jesus came to this world, he wasn't an invincible human being. They, they actually nailed him to a cross, and he actually hurt. And... When you cut him, he bled. When you insulted him, it hurt. Jesus Christ took all our sin upon himself so that we would be right with God. In the Bible, there's a word that you'll encounter often. It's called righteousness. And that means being right with God. So are, are you right with God? The only way you are is if you belong to Jesus Christ. Righteousness in the Bible actually means right relationship. A right relationship. We need to be in a right relationship with God, and we can't do that ourselves. We can't be good enough for God, because none of us are perfect. Jesus Christ is perfect, and so in Him... We are righteous before God. So, being a good person or nice or likable, that doesn't put you in a right standing before God. Only Jesus Christ does. 
So maybe you're, you've, when you've been in a disagreement with somebody you're close with, a friend or something like that, and you're, you talk it out and then at the end you say, are we okay? Are, are we good? Maybe you say something like that. When, when we talk about righteousness, when we're right with God, that's kind of like saying, are we good? And in Jesus Christ alone, God says, yeah, we're good. We're good. Now, as much as we might want, we cannot ignore or defend our pet sins. Okay, we're saved by grace, but that doesn't mean that we can get away with whatever we want. We need to start turning from things. And that doesn't, that doesn't matter if you're a young Christian or if you've been a Christian for 80 years. We need to continually look for ways in which we're not really in line with where God wants us to be and we need to change those things. So, for example, you could be holding on to anger or bitterness. You could be in sexual sin, secret or not. You could be overly attached to people or places or things. You could have a loyalty to a country, for example, that's a little too strong, that even trumps, trumps your loyalty to God's kingdom. I guess the, the question is, what can't you live without? What in your life could be taken away from you and you just would not know how to live without it? Those are the things that you need to reevaluate. Those are the things that are borderline or totally idols. Is there anything that controls you instead of you controlling it? Those are the idols that you need to work on. The real scary thing is not as much that we have idols because in Christ we're right with God. What's more scary is when we start to say that wrong is right. That those idols can stay there. God doesn't have a problem with them. Even worse than sinning is preaching and endorsing sin. That's even worse. I mean, it's one thing if there's somebody who's struggling with a sin and they're and they're working on it, they're praying about it, they know it's wrong and they they want to get better. But it's quite another to say, God doesn't care. I don't have to work on that. That's there's there's nothing in the Bible about that. Or if there is, it that, that doesn't really it's not what this is about. I'm I'm a little special. I I'm I'm in a unique circumstance so it's okay for me. Some of the scariest warnings are in the Bible are against false teachers. False teachers. They make the hair on the back of my neck stand up anyway. Teaching what is false. There's a bunch of them in this chapter here. Verse 12. These men blaspheme in ways they do not understand. They're like brute beasts. They're just animals. They're creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. And like beasts, they too will perish. Verse 14, with eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They're cursed. 17, these men are springs without water and mists driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. 20 and 21, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them to have known, not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command passed down to them. 
or worse, worse off. That's, those are scary words. There's no loopholes there. So, instead of adjusting God to our ideas, we must adjust our ideas to God. The Bible isn't about us, it's about God. And we need to listen. And we can't just read the Bible with our own ideas, and if God doesn't measure up, then we just kind of skip over those parts. So, let's allow ourselves to feel offended by God's words so we'll grow. When you're reading through the Bible, and I hope that you do with some regularity, allow yourself to feel offended so that you'll grow. Offended or rubbed the wrong way, disturbed, however you want to put it. Just allow that to happen. And open the Bible, even before you open it, let's start by assuming we have lingering sins that we need to repent of. Even before we open the Bible, let's assume that, okay, we got stuff that we need to change. Because none of us are perfect. And we need to get our lives in line with who God is. Let's, before we even open the Bible... And this one line in here about how they despise authority, that always stands out to me. Never despise authority, but always have someone who can call you on your sin. Because we are most blind to our own sin. And we need someone else to say, hey, I'm not really sure that that part of your life is so right. Or if that's a good idea. Have you ever thought about rethinking that? We need somebody in our life who can say that. If nobody in our life can say that, then we despise any authority. So instead of ourselves, trust Jesus Christ for our truth and our forgiveness. We could put our trust in ourselves and our, our gut and just what we like and don't like and just assume that God likes those things and doesn't like those things too, that'd be easy. But trust Jesus Christ for truth and your forgiveness because He has both. And to close out, let's uh, answer the question here on the screen. Did I not put it on there? All right, I'll read it for you. What does the sixth request of the Lord's Prayer mean? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one means by ourselves we are too weak to hold our own, even for a moment. And our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh never stop attacking us. And so, Lord, uphold us and make us strong with the strength of your Holy Spirit so that we may not go down to defeat in this spiritual struggle, but may firmly resist our enemies until we finally win the complete victory. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, our God in heaven, Lord, we know that we're sinful, that we are not perfect. We pray that we would not be satisfied with just where we are, that we would not look for comfort or try to make you into our own image, but that, Lord, we would be ready to change, to change our ways, change our thinking, whatever that we need, so that, Lord, we can embrace more fully the grace that you've shown us in Jesus Christ. We're so thankful that we are right with you because of him, and may we embrace him as Lord of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.